So we're going to just jump right in to um, our next presentation, which is with Margaret Tompkins of the Tompkins Foundation for Feline Leukemia Advocacy. And she is going to be talking about the feline leukemia virus and what we should know. Um, Margaret is the president of the Tom Tompkins Foundation for Feline Leukemia Advocacy. She is a tireless advocate for feline leukemia education and feline leukemia positive cats. She actively works um, with, and networks feline leukemia cats all over the country. She is active on social media, especially Facebook, in promoting adoptions and education. She is a huge proponent of TNR and supports shelter and rescue programs that provide positive outcomes for feline leukemia positive cats. Uh, so uh, thankful, Stacey, uh, for being here today. Uh, I do have a foundation that uh, advocates for FELV positive positive cats and there you see the logo that we use and down below that's minx minx is the cat that inspired that logo and minx is just the most inspirational cat i think i've ever met in my life uh, he was at best friends uh, animal sanctuary in utah uh, when he was adopted by a good friend of mine uh, along with his uh, compadres uh, wiley and adeline the three amigos and those cats are just uh, so very special. And Minx, not only did he have <clears throat> FELV, he was blind. He had lost both of his eyes due to an infection. And this is a cat that does not know what a disability is or a limitation. Uh, this cat did everything that he wanted to do. He lived a very full and complete life. Uh, was loved by everybody who uh, knew him, and I'm certainly in the Minx uh, fan club for sure. Thanks so much for answering uh, our poll question today. Uh, it's great that you're not, you don't, you don't get too many. Um, and, and I was impressed with the number of people that had seen more than five. So that means that uh, maybe you're in a shelter environment uh, or a uh, environment where you're encountering a good number of cats and just uh, through your work you have found uh, several that have had uh, FELV. And I really love this that 70% of you are adopting these cats into loving homes. You have made my day uh, just by that number. I will sleep very well tonight and I can't thank you enough for doing it. That is the solution. Uh, for FELV positive cats. And we want to talk about um, uh, certainly uh, some of the other uh, categories here as we go along. I'm impressed also that uh, a number of you are not testing. And that's also what we recommend in most cases is that there's really no need to be testing for FELV or any other virus. You really need to have a good reason for testing. And we'll talk about that more. Uh, this is what got me started. Uh, I think all of us that have had a, a FELV positive cat, and we call them Felux or Felbies, uh, take your choice. Uh, this is what got me started. It wasn't one, it was five. Five little kittens that a good friend of mine was fostering, and I call them the B kittens because their names all started with the letter B. And those of you who are familiar with best friends uh, in those days will recognize probably the top two. That's Bo and Barney. Uh, these kittens uh, were the sickest kittens I've ever seen. Uh, they had every, I think, infection and parasite in the books. And while my good friend was um, taking samples and administering medications, I just got to play with them and cuddle with them. So it was a wonderful experience for me, and I, I truly got to know these uh, uh, kittens and followed them then throughout their, their lives. So they're just uh, so wonderful. And uh, here's two others. Uh, after I'd gotten into uh, working with FELV positive cats, there were two cats that I wanted to save. I got to them in, in time to save them, but uh, I couldn't. They were euthanized, both of them, healthy young cats, just because they had a virus. And that's the one thing that we really want to emphasize is that there's no need to euthanize these cats just because they have a virus. Now, I call this the highlight page. Uh, this is what we're going to focus on today. So these six things, uh, I'm really going to sort of talk about them. And uh, these are the uh, truly the highlights of what we want to uh, share with you today. 
uh, number one, we don't need to be euthanizing uh, cats because they have a virus, any virus, FELV, FIV, it, it just doesn't matter. We don't need to be killing them uh, just because they have a virus. Another myth that we want to dispel is how contagious FELV is. It is contagious. It can be passed from cat to cat, but it's not highly contagious, and we'll talk more about that. We do know now that most of uh, the FELV transfer uh, is by cats fighting, mating, and having kittens. And that's why I know we have a lot of uh, community cat people here today, and I love the work that you do with TNR. TNR is the single best weapon that we have to decrease the prevalence of uh, FELV in the general cat population. If we can spay and neuter cats, that greatly reduces the risk of that virus spreading. So certainly the, the cats then aren't doing the kind of fighting that sort of results in deep bite wounds, which is one of the ways it can be spread, and they're not mating. And thankfully, they're not having kittens after we get them spayed and neutered. We have a new test. This is the quantitative PCR test. I hope that you've uh, heard about it by now and just how useful it is. It is replacing the IFA test. Uh, it can be a confirmation test like the IFA, but it gives us far more information and it costs about the same amount of money. So that's why we're recommending it. Now, we do have a new vaccine uh, on the market. It's a two-year vaccine, a new one from Merrick that has proved to be far superior to anything else that we have currently. So, uh, or that is a current vaccine now. It's just better than all the others that are available. And we'll talk about adoption. And 70% of you are already adopting these cats uh, into loving homes. And that's certainly the recommendation of the American Association of Feline Practitioners. So these are the highlights and things that we're going to be talking about today. Let's talk a bit about the actual virus itself. Uh, it's a retrovirus, and it's specific only to cats. You can't catch it. Your dog can't catch it. The guinea pig can't catch it. It's only a cat virus. Now, outside of the cat, the virus is just a wimpy, fragile virus. It doesn't live long outside of the cat, and it's easily killed. Just washing your hands uh, will kill any virus that's on your hands. So it's easily killed. It's a very fragile virus outside of the cat. Now, inside the cat, it can be devastating. Uh, it compromises the cat's immune system. And when the immune system of the cat gets compromised, that's when they can come down with secondary infections or other diseases. And, and that's generally what they will end up succumbing to, not the FELV, but uh, one of the uh, secondary infections that uh, can occur. Now, we know that FELV can be spread from queen to kitten, so that's a vertical transfer, and then it also comes horizontally from cat to cat. And we also know that um, different cats will have different responses to the virus, and that's due to their immune systems being different. So a cat that has a robust immune system isn't going to pick up FELV no matter how much he's exposed to it. A cat that has a compromised immune system, not as robust as maybe a weaker immune system, that's the cat that is more likely to come down with FELV. We do know that some cats can have FELV and uh, that they can live for years. Uh, and that's one thing that we've learned through the qPCR testing is that some of these cats have a small amount of virus, or at least their immune systems are sufficiently robust that even though they have some virus in their bodies, they're able to deal with it effectively for many years and they can live long, normal lives. Let's talk a bit about how FELV is spread. Now, the vast majority of FELV is spread by cats fighting, mating, and having kittens. So that's why your spay and neuter work 
uh, is so important. If you can spay and neuter cats in the community, you have greatly reduced the risk of FELV spreading. It still can spread, there's other ways, but certainly you have eliminated the primary vector of the spreading of FELV. Most FELV uh, in adult cats is uh, saliva to blood transfer, and that typically is in deep bite wounds. Uh, the saliva is on the teeth of one cat that bites into another cat that hits blood vessels and the virus is transferred. Probably even more likely than the deep bite wounds is the mother cats. Queens can spread the cats, uh, the virus to their kittens either in the womb or through nursing. And that's probably that first litter that I encountered, all five of those as kittens were positive for FELV. And um, um, they, we found out that uh, they, they probably got it from their mother. Saliva to queen transfer, or saliva to blood transfer, and then the queen to kitten transfer, that accounts for most, all of the FELV that you, you have. There are other ways uh, you can share it. Uh, even in uh, cats that have been spayed or neutered, uh, long-term mutual grooming uh, can be a possible vector, uh, as can other bod bodily fluids. So there's other ways. They're just not as prevalent as the uh, uh, saliva to blood transfer. Uh, FELV can be spread through blood transfusions, and that's why we don't recommend that uh, FELV positive cats be blood donors. Certainly, we used to think that FELV was really contagious, and we have found out it's not. This, this uh, statistics will bear that up. We think two to three percent of all the cat population is positive for FELV. Now, that means that 97, 98 percent of cats do not have FELV. So, FELV is certainly contagious. It can be passed from one cat to another, but it's not highly contagious. That's probably one thing that kind of upsets me when I see posts on Facebook uh, is that someone is claiming FELV is highly contagious. Now, when I think highly contagious in cats, I'm thinking Khaleesi virus, uh, Panluke, those are uh, diseases that really bring fear to me but uh, not FELV. It's just not in the same category as those others. Now, Merrick, uh, in some of their work uh, in developing vaccines, uh, they say that as high as 30% of at-risk cats, uh, sick cats, uh, can possibly have uh, come down with FELV. So in certain populations, there is a higher risk. Uh, in the whole general population, it's like 2% but in the really high risk populations, uh, the cats that have compromised immune systems, they're the ones that are more likely to come down with FELV and to succumb to an FELV related disease. Let's talk testing. Uh, I was so interested in a number of you put in the chat that uh, you don't even test for FELV. And um, if you are testing, uh, for anything. You need to have a good reason for doing it. Testing costs money, and that money can be put to lots of good uses. So if you have a good reason for testing for FELV, then certainly do it. But if you don't have a good reason, stop testing. No need to test for anything, and we'll talk more about that when it comes to, say, TNR. But uh, you want to know why you're testing, and if that money can be put to better use, then so be it. Uh, and what do you do then when you have positive cats that uh, have FELV? We have uh, long relied upon screening tests, what we call point of care test uh, for uh, FELV. Uh, Dr. Julie Levy uh, is the foremost expert on FELV uh, in the country. She's done a lot of research. She's a veterinarian as well as a PhD and has worked, uh, like I said, lots of research with uh, Austin Pets Alive and their uh, cat community there. And they 
did uh, some testing where they wanted to find out just what was the best test available. So they rounded up all this very large, large number of cats, and they gave them all the tests. They just tested, you know, all the different kinds of tests available. And they did find that the SNAP test from IDEX was superior to the other point of care uh, test. So that is the best test that you can get. Now that comes in two varieties. You can get the SNAP test, which is a combo test. It tests for FELV, FIV, and heartworm. Save yourself a little money. Uh, if you're testing, then just get the FELV test. Really no need to be testing for uh, FIV. Now the problem with um, the SNAP test and other point of care test is that they're uh, prone to false positives. Even the manufacturer, IDEX, of the SNAP test says that it's 95% accurate. Now that means it's 5% inaccurate. And that's under perfect conditions. That's perfect humidity, uh, perfect temperature, uh, perfect technician and technical expertise in administering the test. In the field, uh, people will tell you that it's more like 30%. So there's a wide range of false positives, and that's why we should never base uh, uh, outcomes of a cat uh, uh, based on a SNAP test. And we also know now that cats can test positive one day and negative the next. Uh, stress certainly plays a uh, huge response to their immune system. So if they're under a stressful situation, a cat may test positive, and then eliminating that stress, the cat may test negative. And Dr. Levy uh, says that we simply can't get this type of certainty. We love to put cats in boxes, and cats love boxes. But this is just one box we can't put a cat in. Um, they, we would like them to be either positive or negative, period. It makes life so much easier. But that just isn't the way it is. We have discordant cats that throughout their lives, they may test positive on occasion and negative on occasion. Certainly, no cat, no cat on this planet should be euthanized because it tests positive for FELV or any other virus. Absolutely no excuse to euthanize uh, a cat because it tests positive. Now we have the uh, uh, qPCR test that is rapidly replacing the IFA test, which we used to run as a confirmation test. It gives us much more information and it costs about the same amount of money. So we are rapidly uh, going towards using the qPCR. So let's talk about that one. Now the test that you want to get is, I'm putting the number right here, it's 263.55. Now IDEX has a bunch of tests that have very similar sounding names. And by time you request it and the vet request it, then uh, you lose a little in the translation. Uh, so go by the number. You want 263.55, and we'll kind of um, talk more about that as to why you want this particular test. It gives us a measure of how much virus is in the cat. For a long time, we noticed that some cats with FELV didn't live very long, uh, maybe a few months, uh, two and a half years, I think was about average. And yet then we had some cats that were like 14 years old. So how do we explain some of this? And what we have found is that uh, cats have different amounts of virus. They're positive for FELV, but some of them uh, have not so much virus in them. Others have a lot more. So this qPCR test from IDEX, it puts the dividing point at a million copies of the virus per milliliter of whole blood. Now that's whole blood that was taken on a particular day, a point in time. And if it's more than that, a million or more, uh, it's classified as a progressive infection. And if it's less than that, it's a regressive infection. So just that information gives us a lot of ability to sort of think about the prognosis of the cat. 
um, maybe how long the cat might live. Every cat, of course, is an individual, and um, it's uh, not easy making generalizations about them, but we certainly now have some uh, real numbers, and we're starting to now look at these numbers, you know, how much is a, a really a lot of virus, and how much is it? This uh, regressively infected cats, uh, we know that uh, we, they're still positive for FELV, and, but they're not shedding the virus, and, and they're not contagious to other cats. But the progressively infected cats, these are the ones that are shedding the virus. They are more likely to develop um, uh, FELV-related disease. They're uh, contagious, and they probably will have a shorter length of life. It's important to remember that this number is at a point in time. And as we said before, uh, this can change over time. So it's pos possible for the number to go up, the number can go down. Uh, it's possible for a regressively infected cat to become progressively infected uh, and vice versa. So it is a, strictly a, at a point in time that this test is done and the number should be thought about in those terms. Now the reason we like this um, 26355 test, it actually is going to do two, two tests. It does the qPCR and the qPCR is looking for the DNA and the RNA in the blood and this is what is in the lymph nodes uh, or lymph system. And it's possible that a cat can be negative, come up negative on the qPCR. But remember, you probably didn't get the qPCR until it showed up as a positive on that SNAP test. And that SNAP test is an ELISA test, and it's looking for the P27 antigen. Now, the 263.55 test from IDEX is going to run two tests. It's going to run a lab-controlled ELISA test, uh, just like you did on the SNAP, uh, but they're, they're perfections at this. These are people that do nothing but run these tests all day long. So they're in the, you know, the perfect uh, humidity, temperature, everything. They really are experts in this, so it's the best possible ELISA test that you can have done. And they're looking at the P27 antigen. Now, if that comes up positive, and yet the uh, qPCR is negative, there's no DNA. See, they're looking for different things. That can point to a focal infection. And for some reason, FELV can settle in one organ of a cat, um, uh, such as the mammary glands of a queen. And it's not found in the blood, it's not found in the lymph system, but it's in the cat. The cat is positive. We consider that to be regressively infected they're not shedding the virus and they're not contagious. But this is the one case where your qPCR can turn up to be negative and uh, the cat still has some FELV, but it's a focal uh, infection. So that's the reason we ask that you get this 26355. It's not any more expensive than any of the other um, QPCR tests are from IDEX. So, in fact, some people report it is cheaper, uh, I think, because they run more of them. But this is the one that you definitely want to get. Now, let's talk about the risk of your cat getting uh, FELV. We know that in the whole cat population, the millions of cats that are out there, two or three percent of them have uh, FELV. And Merrick says that up to 30 percent of what they call high risk in sick cats. And that means that even in the really sick cat population, uh, 70 percent of them don't have FELV. And here's a list of the ones that uh, are most at risk. And the one thing that all of these cats have in common is they probably have a weakened or compromised immune system. So FELV, the presence of it or not, uh, the ability of a cat to fight it off or not, is very dependent upon the cat's immune system. So that's why we focus uh, on the immune system for these cats. We keep that in mind with everything that we do to help them. And uh, uh, we certainly know that um, these are the risk factors, uh, 
kittens certainly are very young. They have immature immune systems, uh, and certainly old cats, when they start to get frail, it's just kind of like people. Uh, we've learned a lot from the viruses that have been floating around uh, COVID and everything the last several years. And it's the young people and the old people that are more susceptible, and it's because they simply don't have the immune systems that can fight off uh, these viruses. Let's talk vaccine. Merrick, Merrick is a large uh, pharmaceutical company. Um, they invest a lot of money in developing a vaccine, bringing it to market, getting FDA approval. Uh, and this can take a lot of time and certainly a lot of money. It's an investment on their part. And they wouldn't be doing that unless they thought there was a market for that vaccine. And what they are finding is that these FELV cats are highly adoptable. And 70% of you said that, you know, that's what you do with them. You find them loving homes and get them adopted. And the Merrick people uh, see this as, a, as income revenue. So that's why they have worked very hard to produce this vaccine. Uh, in some of their testing that they have done, they compared this new two-year vaccine with all the others that are on the market, and it proved to be far superior uh, than anything else that we had available. So right now, this is the very best vaccine that you can get for negative cats. You don't vaccinate the positive ones. You vaccinate the negative ones to keep them from getting FELV. In some of their studies, they proved that they were 100% effective, but these were, had small sample sizes, uh, and you just can't judge everything by that. I really want to see the study that has 1,000 cats so we can get really an accurate measure of how it is. But um, I will say that no, no vaccine is 100% effective, but this one is as good as it gets, and it's available, um, I mean, from your veterinarian. It is a two-year dose after an initial dose of um, uh, two, uh, one milliliter, um, uh, like three or four weeks apart. And then after that, uh, after the initial dose, it becomes a two-year vaccine. Now, let's talk about mixed households. Uh, this comes up frequently, and you see a lot of it on uh, social media. Um, Typically, uh, someone finds out they have a mixed household. Um, someone has uh, five or six cats. They've had them for five years all together. They don't go outdoors. Uh, they just have their other cats for company. One of them gets sick, and she takes the cat to the vet to find out not only does the cat have FELV, but it has now developed an FELV-related disease. She has all the others tested, and they're negative. So this is a mixed household. It happened quite by accident. She didn't willingly, uh, you know, uh, put an FELV positive cat in with the negative cats, but they've all lived together for a long period of time. And this is uh, what we call an accidental mixing of households. And this is how most people end up with mixed households. They simply didn't know that they were mixed until they found out otherwise. Now, I will tell you, if you're thinking about uh, mixing a household deliberately, that's a whole different scenario. You really need to think about what you're doing. I will tell you that the only 100% sure way to prevent the spread of FELV in your household is to separate the positive cats from the negative cats. Now, they can share the same space, just not at the same time. So if you have a nice living room, uh, you can let, you know, the positives out for part of the day and then the negatives. Uh, you can interact with them, certainly. Remember, just washing your hands, which is a good thing to do between cats anyway, uh, will take care of anything, any virus that might end up being on your hands. We do know that uh, just getting the cats spayed and neutered uh, greatly reduces the risk of FELV spreading, and you probably don't have any cats in your house that have not been fixed, uh, maybe due to other reasons, but uh, certainly probably most of yours are already spayed and neutered. Now, certainly uh, getting the negative cats vaccinated further reduces the risk of that FELV spreading. But remember that FELV can be spread uh, in other ways. For example, long-term mutual grooming. 
and cats that live together, sometimes they groom each other, sometimes they groom each other a lot. So that is a risk for a way to transfer the FELV. So even though the risk is low, it's very low, it's not zero. So that's why you need to think consciously uh, before you make a decision to have a mis mixed household deliberately. One caution I always look at is right now, maybe all of your negative cats are perfectly healthy, but are they getting older? Remember that older cats uh, can have more weakened immune systems. So you want to think about, you know, how old and how healthy are your negative cats before you introduce them. And again, I love doors. Doors were made for a reason and uh, doors work very well. I know a number of people that have both positive and negative cats in their home, and they simply have a strategic plan for uh, when doors are open and when they're closed and who gets to go in and who gets to go out. So it's really a wonderful way of managing uh, both populations uh, to the benefit of everyone. Now let's talk TNR. I love TNR. I love TNR people. Um, you do a great service, not only to the community, and whether you knew it or not, you are doing an awful lot to decrease the risk of FELV spreading in the community. We know what, how FELV is spread. We know that just getting these cats spayed and neutered uh, really almost eliminates the FELV. So it is within our grasp. We have the number one tool to decrease the spread of FELV, and that's through your TNR efforts. Now, I know that a lot of you, um, uh, I had mentioned that uh, you weren't testing for FELV, and that's great. If you are doing TNR, that is your mission in life, and I love it, I support it fully and donate to these causes, um, you, you don't need to, to test for FELV or anything else. Simply put that money back into doing more TNR. You get a better return from your investment, and uh, there's no need uh, for looking for the FELV. Now, I've always said that you, you need a good reason to test for FELV or anything, but there are reasons. Uh, do you encounter the occasional sick cat? And if it's sick, do you uh, take it then to a vet? I think most uh, people doing TNR uh, responsibly do that if the cat is sick. Now that's the time that you wanna test for FELV and maybe do some blood work uh, to see what's up with that cat. Uh, and even then uh, you spay and neuter the cat, you medicate as appropriate, and then return the cat to its home uh, where it was found. Uh, some people worry about the uh, risk to the FELV cat. Uh, uh, I've heard people uh, say that uh, they die a terrible death out there on the streets. And that is another myth that we just should dispel. Typically, FELV cats live long, healthy lives without any symptoms. They're asymptomatic for their entire lives until they're at the very end and then they can crash and be gone very quickly. So it really, um, when it comes to worrying about the, uh, the death of an FELV cat on the streets, you needn't be co too concerned that there, it's, it's not one of these slow and painful things. Um, kidney disease that's kind of degenerative or, or uh, maybe arthritis, um, uh, some of these, uh, uh, kidney disease and, and things that are de debilitating for a cat uh, kind of happen over a long length of time. And, but that's, that's just not the way FELV works. FELV is just kind of a silent killer. And when I say that they can uh, crash and be gone quickly, I mean it can be within hours or days. It can happen very quickly. Uh, that's when the uh, virus finally overcomes the immune system's ability to respond to it. And then the cat is just gone very quickly. So don't think that um, the, the risk is uh, to the other cat population. If you have gotten that positive cat neutered or spayed, 
um, that's the very best that you can do. You have just practically uh, eliminated the possibility of that cat spreading the virus to any other cat. So the risk for that community cat is on that cat. And it's because that cat has a compromised immune system and it can easily pick up other infections and diseases uh, from the cats that are on the, the streets. So uh, think, think good things about your FELV cat. You are not hurting it by putting it back out in its home, uh, even if it tests positive and uh, you've done everything that you can medically uh, to help that cat. Now, some words from uh, our experts. Uh, three years ago uh, this month, the American Association of Feline Practitioners came out with their guidelines for cats with retroviruses, and that's FELV and FIV. And what they recommended was adoption. Adoption was the way to go with these cats. And they don't make recommendations like this very often. I think their last guidelines were in 2008, uh, and that was mostly on FIV cats. So uh, they have this, it's been out three years now this month, and it's excellent. It's uh, 26 pages of kind of fine print. I have links to it here. And by the way, there's, um, I wrote a paper uh, to go along with this presentation. It's in the handouts, you can download that. I've talked quite a bit more about uh, some of these uh, things that we're just even briefly mentioning here. Uh, there's a lot more expanded uh, conversation about those things uh, in the paper and a number of handouts. Uh, there's plenty of links that you can click on um, to uh, uh, get those instantly brought up on your computer that you can read and become even uh, more uh, learned than you are now. Uh, but we do want to focus on uh, uh, that adoption is the number one thing that you can do for these cats. It's better than sanctuaries. Um, sanctuaries don't have their humans 24-7 cuddling them. And uh, these FELV positive cats love their humans. Um, uh, they're just so affectionate and loving. Uh, I, I can't say enough about them. Uh, but they definitely respond to uh, the great care that they, they get. And uh, adoption uh, for any cat is probably the best solution that we have. Now, how to care for an FELV cat if you own one uh, or if you come into contact uh, with some. Uh, remember that um, uh, this is, uh, I don't want to say fragile, uh, but uh, you there are some things to watch for. An FELV positive cat uh, has a compromised immune system. So you want to protect them from getting uh, secondary infections that can really cause them trouble. Uh, uh, you don't want them uh, uh, to linger in an illness. If your cat gets sick, uh, take it to the vet. Uh, vets can help uh, and typically, uh, uh, FELV positive cats need some assistance in getting over an illness. It may take two doses of an antibiotic to clear up a URI. Um, it may take um, uh, more effective uh, high-powered antibiotics, uh, for example. So if the first sign of an illness, you want to get your kitty uh, to the vet. And twice yearly visits are recommended and maybe do blood work um, every year or every 18 months. And that's just so you can keep an eye on the numbers. All those numbers, uh, your veterinarian is uh, and somewhat of an expert in reading those numbers and knowing what they mean uh, and, and can uh, perhaps uh, do some preventative things to uh, help your cat along the way. Now, for FELV positive cats, there's uh, two things that we really recommend more than anything else. They need a high quality diet and a low stress environment. That's what you need for an FELV cat, a high quality diet and a low stress free environment. Now, for the uh, uh, food, we know that uh, there's a uh, site called catinfo.org. I urge you to check it out. It's the number one site I've ever found for nutrition uh, for cats. Um, 
cats are carnivores and they need protein and in particular animal protein. Now dogs, dogs can get along with plant protein and the veggies, they do just fine. But cats, cats are the carnivores. Uh, they're meat eaters and they need animal protein. Um, if you go to this site, uh, uh, there is a chart that you can look up that gives you the measure of how much fat, carbs, and protein that are in most cat foods. Supplements, when it comes to supplements, um, it's the Wild West. Some of these supplements um, are all marketing. I'm not sure if they do any good to the cat. They can be very expensive. So I urge caution when you are looking at uh, supplements to boost a cat's immune system. Lysine is the one I recommend. Uh, it's cheap. It seems to work wonders for some cats and does nothing for others. Uh, but it has, uh, I think, shown some uh, anecdotal evidence of uh, uh, support for immune systems. Uh, so keep in mind that supplements, by and large, are not regulated by the FDA. So we don't know what their uh, efficiency are or how safe they are. So I just urge you to be cautious about um, supplements. I mentioned a low stress environment. Anything that the cat doesn't like can produce stress. So you want to eliminate all of those things. Uh, cats sometimes like their own space, so you don't want to crowd them. Um, this is where sanctuaries can be a bit of a problem for FELV cats because they simply don't have enough space for them. So uh, the low stress environment, and that's specific to the cat. Some things will stress one cat and not another. So you need to really be tuned into the cat and what the cat doesn't like and make sure that you cut those things out of the cat's life. I do urge you to join one group, whether you own an FELV cat or not. It's called, uh, it's a Facebook group, Owners of FELV Positive, FIV Positive Cats. Uh, it's run by Tracy Miller out of uh, uh, Baltimore or in Maryland. Uh, it's an excellent group. It's a large group. Uh, it has a number of uh, experts there, very knowledgeable people. You can ask questions. Uh, this would be where you want to ask maybe some questions about a supplement that you're considering. You might have some people that have some experience with it that can give you some uh, answers as to whether it's it's good or not good. So uh, it's a great uh, site. It's uh, uh, well run, well administered, uh, lots of, and it's all very positive. Uh, people there uh, talk about their cats, and it's it's a great support system. Now let's talk about adoption. Um, I have provided a, a paper I mentioned uh, in the handouts. If you download that, there's a bunch of other stuff that goes with this. Uh, I hope that you will find helpful. Um, uh, there's lots of ways to get your cat adopted. Um, certainly, uh, it's the recommended solutions. Um, I love some of the research that Austin Pets Alive has done in sort of the customer satisfaction survey. They find out that these people love these cats, um, and they have really high adopter satisfaction ratings, and they also become repeat adopters. So think about, um, uh, you know, you want to get these into a loving home. Um, and typically we say that it should go into a home as an only cat or a cat only with FELV positive cats. You can get cats adopted locally uh, through social media or a combination of the both. I really like local adoptions. With local adoptions, you can work with an adopter. Um, I have one of the handouts that's in that package is a fact sheet. You can download that, laminate it, print it out, and laminate it, and have it right there with the cat. So you can talk about FELV with the adopter so the adopter knows exactly what they're getting. And it's really interesting that uh, uh, some of our best adopters are either old, older people or younger people. It's like um, a cat is basically a 20-year commitment. Maybe with an FELV positive cat, you're looking at maybe a five-year commitment. So uh, a lot of people, uh, that's what they're looking for. Uh, they want a cat that's not going to outlive them probably, or a cat where they may not know what they're doing uh, five years later. So young people and old people make excellent adopters of these cats. Uh, 
Now, if you, um, uh, you can post uh, uh, on local message boards, I think the next door uh, is in every neighborhood uh, in the country. Uh, there are several right around where I live for the different neighborhoods and groups, and um, they, they find great success in rehoming uh, cats. Now, if you go through special media, I urge you to, uh, or social media, I urge you to look at some of the information I've provided in the handouts there. Uh, you want to be a bit careful on social media. Uh, don't post your phone number, for example. Um, if you really want to keep sort of at an arm's length away from social media, uh, then maybe you go out and uh, get a new social media account, Fluffy Needs a Home, uh, at gmail.com. Get an email address and uh, then use that to get a Facebook uh, account, Fluffy Needs a Home, and post from there. So you're kind of, you know, a little bit uh, associate away from it. And when it comes to posting on social media, um, you have to you have to have a great photograph or several, and um, you want a good description. Uh, don't go with the pity party uh, type thing, you know, uh, on your cat. Uh, that doesn't work. Uh, with social media, you have three seconds to get someone's attention, and that you do with an outstanding photograph. And if you don't take outstanding photographs, you go out and get a friend who does and have them take pictures of your cat. And the same way with a description, you want to, you have five seconds. If someone's on the picture and likes the picture, they're looking at the description, you have five more seconds to keep their attention. And that is one sentence or maybe two short ones. So you want to pack those first two sentences with all the wonderful, enduring qualities about this cat. Now, certainly later on, you can say it has FELV and talk about what that is, but don't lead with the pity party routine. It just doesn't work. So please look through those notes that we have in the, the handouts there. I think you'll find them very useful. Now, veterinarians. Veterinarians uh, uh, are your lifeline. Uh, with helping your uh, FELV positive cats. And I hear a lot that veterinarians aren't familiar with FELV and the current thing. And remember that a lot of what we've learned about FELV has only come in the last couple of years, and probably most vets have been out of school for longer than that. I have found that um, these veterinarians are very responsive to uh, like one of Dr. Levy's webinars that you send, you know, email them. Um, it's wonderful. It has direct links to the science behind it. And within a short amount of time, a veterinarian can become somewhat knowledgeable on FELV. So don't discount your veterinarian. That is your primary resource for the health of your, your cat. And again, we're back to these key takeaways I said that we would uh, have, and I can't focus enough on uh, these six things. I hope that we have covered them, uh, and we want to focus on those. Remember, no reason to euthanize an FELV positive cat, period. Not a reason on this earth to do it. So if you're doing it, stop doing it, and uh, I'm so glad that there's not too many that are left doing it. So uh, please contact me if you have any questions on that. I'll certainly try to help you in any way that I can. It's not nearly as contagious as we once thought, and we know that just uh, spaying and neutering cats greatly reduces the chance of that virus spreading. A wonderful new vaccine that we've got and a wonderful, uh, fairly new test that gives us a great deal of information about these cats. So those are the important takeaways that I have for you. And just a little extra for our cat friends. Um, that's my uh, Felu cat Dill, uh, working hard, getting ready for the Chiefs game tomorrow. And uh, again, I got that, the catinfo.org, everything that you wanted to know about nutrition there on cats. And the Community Cats podcast, I can't say enough about uh, Stacy and her great group and the wonderful work that they do. Um, uh, just bookmark them, uh, take everything that they have to offer. Uh, they even have a wonderful FELV uh, shirt that's available, so I urge you to think about that. A couple of additional ones. Um, there's a Focus on Felines group that meets every Thursday, and the link is in uh, the papers uh, that are in the handouts there. It's free. It's always a discussion about cats. 
uh, and it's always a good topic and it's free. In addition, we have the Maddie's call on Mondays. Uh, take advantage of that. It's free, always great presentations. Now, sometimes they're not always on cats. They cover a lot of different topics, uh, but always great presentations. And they give away money. Uh, I got $1,000 from them uh, for attending one of their uh, sessions, and that money went to spay and neuter some cats in Nashville, Indiana. So it was well uh, used. And my email address there, uh, feel free to contact me or you can put it in the uh, uh, chat if you'd like, uh, Stacy, and I'll, I'll turn it back to you for uh, some questions. So just to reiterate, I'm just going to sort of group some questions here. Um, couple scenarios, nose to nose, through a fence, litter box use, um, you know, cat furniture and cleaning and all of that stuff. We don't need to be super worried about the spread of the virus through those scenarios. Uh, big answer is uh, maybe a little, but not much. Um, the the virus uh, the virus would be on the nose of a cat. Uh, uh, I have, it, it 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 is possible. It is not probable. So if you have a thousand cats, maybe one. You know, we don't know yet. Uh, you know, it wasn't too long ago that we were killing these cats. So now that we are keeping them alive, we're learning an awful lot about them. So uh, it really takes long-term intimate contact for the virus to spread. So let's put it that way. Touching noses is not what I consider long-term intimate contact. Got you, okay, all right. Um... So what do we do in a scenario when a veterinarian that we are working with for TNR or just in general um, refuses to allow us to return a positive feline leukemia cat? Now, I would say you would only test that cat if it appeared sickly, and then it probably wouldn't be wise Correct. to return the cat anyway if it tested positive because it probably has something else going on. But if you have a veterinarian, I mean, I'm still hearing about veterinarians that are requiring testing for any cats from the outside that organizations are forced to work with where we have this shelf, the, the uh, shortage of veterinarians. You know, any, any good words of wisdom to try and advocate for a veterinarian to change their practices? Um, you can share some of this information. Share one of Dr. Levy's webinars. I have found that to be so successful. Uh, and I've been thanked by veterinarians for appointing them to that. Uh, so share some information with them. Um, we know that um, uh, you're doing TNR, the cat is sick, so you take the cat in, and chances are the cat isn't deathly ill or anything. It has a URI, perhaps, an upper respiratory infection. So a round of antibiotics, uh, and you keep the cat for a few days, it's okay, and you you put it back where you found it. So it's really okay to do that. Don't feel guilty. That cat is, uh, if you've got it spayed or neutered, uh, it's not going to be spreading the virus to other cats. The risk is solely to that cat because it does have a compromised immune system and it can get sick. So that's the, the risk is just to that cat, but there's no reason to euthanize the cat. Uh, uh, it's great if it's a friendly cat and you want to try to find it a home, more power to you. Uh, but that's if it comes down to putting the cat back to where you found it and euthanizing it, put the cat back. The cat was getting along fine before you walked along and trapped it, and it's going to get along probably pretty good after you leave. Yep, agreed 100%. Um, the way I look at it, too, is we're just borrowing those cats for 24 hours to get them spayed or neutered. We're not like making these other kinds of decisions. We're just we're about getting them spayed and neutered. And if they're healthy and they're not suffering in any way, put them put them right back. Um, OK, so there was oh, would a cat vaccinated with the previous version of the feline leukemia vaccine need the two dose regimen of the new vaccine? Oh, ask your veterinarian. Uh, I, I'm thinking probably not. 
uh, but that would be definitely a, a question for your veterinarian. I know this is a, a new vaccine, so we haven't had a, available, but I know that people that are routinely vaccinating yearly their negative cats, uh, they want to switch to this uh, bi yearly. Uh, because it, uh, you know, saves them a vet visit, uh, saves them time, stress on the cat, just lots of good things about it. So, yeah, that's definitely a vet question. My my guess is that you would not go back to the initial doses. So, um, one final question, and I'm just going to um, remind the group, we have an online feline leukemia day in July. So, this is just a snapshot of what we cover for a whole seven hours in, in July. And I wanna say it's like the 15th or the 18th or somewhere in the middle of July. And um, so maybe we'll we'll put that up. We have a calendar on our website. You can go there and, and take a look at it. And I think you can even sign up and register for it. Now, we don't have the speaker lineup fully put together. We've got like half of our speakers together, but one of those speakers um, may be a person um, who represents a state um, Margaret, can you just touch upon a little bit about some, some of the state regulations that have restricted us with regards to feline leukemia positive cats? Okay, do we have another six hours here? <laughs> they exist. I mainly want to make sure people know they, they exist. exist. We have them at the community level, the county level, state level, any, any uh, governmental jurisdiction probably has some ordinances that maybe are not very good to cats. And in particular, uh, Kansas. Kansas still has that nasty law on the books about euthanizing FELV positive cats. Now, to my understanding, uh, they haven't really been killing any of them lately, uh, and it's uh, been changed in the agricultural law, and they're just waiting for some final approvals. But we still have some uh, counties that and states that prevent transporting cats. If your cat has FELV, you can't transport it. Well, phooey, I want to drive across Kansas, and I've got an FELV positive cat. I'm going to drive across Kansas. Um, I will tell you that in a lot of cases, these laws are not enforced. Certainly, they are not for owned cats. The most knowledgeable veterinarians I have ever met have been in the state of Kansas. So, and they, they're very good to their FELV clients. So this is, it's, it's uh, the only ones it hurts are the unowned FELV positive cats that end up in a shelter, period. Um, those are the ones that people want to, you know, and there's no reason to euthanize them there or any place else. So what you should do is research your own community, your own state, and as a proactive measure, begin the lobbying to get these laws changed because it doesn't happen overnight. It takes a lot of time and we should, I think, work to try and proactively just get these things off the books because they, they don't make sense. I absolutely agree. Become uh, an advocate uh, for these cats. Once you've encountered one, it's like you want to fight for these cats because they are just so special, uh, so wonderful. Um, you, you want to fight for them and advocate for them. You can do it positively by, you know, contacting your, um, all of your politicians that are in office and certainly uh, uh, anyone that uh, pointing out how they're all, the only state in the country that still has gas chambers, for example, for cats. Uh, Utah is one. I'm not sure what, I forgot the other one. But, you know, advocate for these cats. Um, uh, you're, we, we've, we've come a long way in a short amount of time. That's all I can say. And that's one reason I wanted to do this presentation today is that uh, there is so much that has changed so rapidly. And um, I fully endorse the, the fee loop day, which will be in July, I believe. Uh, who knows what science we're going to find out between now and then. So definitely tune in for uh, the latest Excellent, wonderful, wonderful. So I'm gonna read a quote directly from the audience here, Margaret. This should be mandatory training for all shelters and rescues. This is awesome. Hey, so. let me know where you want me to be and I'll be there. <laughs> Certainly uh, share everything that I have in that uh, package of materials and the slides uh, are totally shareable. Uh, nothing is copywritten uh, uh, and feel free to contact me. 
uh, you can reach me at my email address there uh, or uh, on Facebook or through Messenger on Facebook. Uh, I'll be happy to respond to you. All right. Um, thank you so much, Margaret.